Heavenly Father, Father, you are the, the God of new beginnings. You are a God who makes dead things come to life. And Father, you did that first in our hearts as we came to faith, leaving behind the, the deadness of our spirit and soul to come to know you in a better and true way and to come to life in that, to be born again by that. And you bring our lives, Father, from emptiness and meaninglessness into purpose. And you will one day take our bodies, these bodies of death, as Paul calls them, and you will be replacing them with a body that will never die. And in our hearts, in our minds, Father, you renew us. You take us from old dead thinking and old and dead ideas, and you replace them, Father, with something true and meaningful and eternal. And we come to you today as we begin a new study, looking for just that outcome, Father, that you would bring us to something better, not only in what we think and know, but, Father, in what we live, how we live, what we do, who we are. And, Father, that will take time, and we will give it that time. We pledge, Father, that we will be here when we can. We will be seated at your feet listening, and we will take what you give us, Father, to heart, and we will put it into action in our lives, Father. That is your, require, your request. That is our desire. Let it be so. And Father, thank you for a place where we have that renewal opportunity each week. Build us, strengthen us, guide us, so that we fulfill all that you had intended in that, and that we glorify you to the greatest possible extent. And we pray all this, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to open with a little story, one that you may have heard about a family with a couple of boys. These were twin boys, but they were really just twins in name only. They, other than appearance, there was really nothing in common between these two kids. In fact, they had a, a tendency to always be on the opposite side of any issue, any question. If one wanted the TV louder, the other one wanted it quieter. If one wanted you know, the food hotter, the other one wanted it less hot. It just went like this all the time. And in one particular way, they were very different. One boy was an eternal optimist. One boy was the eternal pessimist. And the father of these two boys thought, you know, this is not healthy. I got two kids on either end of a spectrum. What I really need is for both kids to sort of be in the middle, see each other's point of view, be more balanced. And he thought of a way he could maybe encourage that by one Christmas, he was going to give all of the presents to one of the kids instead of splitting them up between the two. He would take the pessimist who always had the negative outlook on life and he said, I'll give him all the gifts, at least initially, he'll think they're all his. And then we'll see how his perspective changes. And then to the one who is always optimistic, never could be found unhappy, the father said, well, we'll just see what this does for him. I'll, I'll take and give him no toys. In fact, instead he put a pile of manure in the boy's room thinking that's got to be something the kid will react to. So anyway, the next day, the next morning, as he comes to check on his boys, finding the first, the one with all the gifts, he's amazed the kid's sitting amongst them crying, and he can't figure it out. He says, why in the world are you unhappy with all these gifts? And the kid says, well, first of all, they all need batteries. I don't have any batteries. They're going to break one day. I'll have to fix them. I don't know how to use them. I haven't found the instruction manual. i got friends who are going to come over. They're going to be jealous at all my gifts. I'm going to have to referee their fights. It's, it's the worst day of my life. Father just shakes his head. What's he going to do with that? He walks off. He goes to the other room, the optimist room. Here's the optimist dancing on top of the pile of manure, <laughs> gleefully digging through it. The father says, I don't understand this at all. What in the world are you so happy about? And the son says, well, there's got to be a pony in here somewhere. <laughs> I love that story. It's an old one. You may have heard it, but it tells a, a tale that's true for us. Our perspective in life can often be at odds with the reality of it, right? And... At times, in our walk as a Christian, you will be sad, you will be depressed, things will happen to you that are not what people want, and yet at the same time, it can be possible for you to have an attitude that everything is going fine. Uh, or I said differently, you can be sad and depressed even though everything is going just fine, or you can have all those trials and you can find joy in the midst of it, right? That paradox I'm describing, that is the natural state of every believer according to Jesus, that is, that's where we're supposed to be. Remember when Jesus said this in Luke chapter 6, verse 22? He said, blessed are you when men hate you. Normally when people hate us, we're not feeling very happy about that. But he says, no, you should look at it differently. When they ostracize you, when they insult you, when they scorn your name as evil for the sake of the Son of Man, he says, be glad in that day and leap for joy. Kind of like the kid on the top of the pile of manure. Why? He says, because your reward is great in heaven. And then he says a few verses later, Woe to you when all men speak well of you. For their fathers used to treat the false prophets in the same way. Think about that next time you get too many likes on your Facebook page. Right? There's, there's a paradox there. There is a conundrum there. That when the world says we should be glad about something, often that's a warning sign. 
That is, it may mean that we're investing our time in the wrong place. And when the world hates us for what we say or do, it can mean that we're exactly where God wanted us to be. It's paradoxical. Now, it's also easily explainable. And by that, I mean this. If you have Jesus's perspective, then you'll get it. You'll understand why that's a truth statement. What is his perspective? Well, you can sum it up neatly in a phrase that I think you've heard me use here more than a few times, and that is this. You live with eyes for eternity. Living with eyes for for eternity, it just means this. You adopt an eternal perspective. You recognize this. You are just passing through this life. It's the next one that really counts. And as a result, you want to put everything in this world to work for the sake of what the next one will have for you, including trials that might come into your life. So everything that happens to us, everything that happens around us, we know can be useful to God for the sake of the kingdom, for the sake of what he's trying to do in building the kingdom. And that means this, that our mission in this life and in all the twists and turns that come our way, our mission is to maximize our obedience and maximize God's glory. That's our goal. That is living with eyes for eternity. And as we go into this new study of Philippians, verse by verse, you're going to hear me use this phrase from time to time, living with eyes for eternity. Why? Because it's at the heart of this letter. That's what this letter is all about. You'll have to have that perspective if you want to understand this letter. Otherwise, this letter will make no sense to you at all because it's going to ask you to do things that just don't equate, don't don't make sense to someone in this world. And as we get into this study, here's what we're going to do. You know, teaching a, a, an epistle. An epistle uh, is just a fancy Bible word for a letter. Uh, teaching a letter is a lot harder in many ways than teaching a narrative. A narrative would be like Genesis or uh, what we just finished. A gospel is a form of a narrative. You know, if you can't teach a narrative in a way that's interesting, you shouldn't be in this job. It's just storytelling. But epistles are not that way, so it's a little more challenging, right? If you've sat through studies where people taught letters, you might be kind of wondering if this is one you want to go through again with me because sometimes those are dry and they're all theory and thought at a high level. You don't really get into the big picture of it. It's hard to follow. That's, that's my job. My job is to make this as interesting as a narrative, to make sure you don't lose the thread. And let me tell you, this is a letter that can change your walk with Christ fundamentally, more so perhaps than any other letter in this book. And so as we get into it today, I want to do a little homework for you. There's a little bit of pre, pre-work we got to do. We need to learn a little bit about who wrote it and who they wrote it to, because in some sense, reading an epistle is like reading someone else's mail. If I took a letter out of your mailbox, started reading it, it would be hard for me to get it if I didn't understand something about who wrote it and what they, were, what they know about you and what they were saying to you. I need to get into the flow of that. So that's our job today. A little bit of background and then a little bit of start in a letter. And so... To do that, we just need to read it because it actually gives us opportunity in itself. Look at verse one. It starts with Paul and Timothy, bondservants of Christ Jesus, to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are in Philippi, including the overseers and deacons. All right, that gives us a chance to talk about the who's here. Who wrote it? Paul. We all heard his name. We all know who we're talking about here. I assume many of you know his history. Just as a quick recap, Paul, otherwise known as Saul, and by the way, don't get wrapped around that too much. It's just a Greek versus a Jewish name. Saul in Hebrew, Paul in Greek, same person. And he began his ministry career as a zealous, law-keeping Pharisee. Paul was a Pharisee. And in Acts chapter 7, Luke tells us that at the early stages of the church, when the very first martyr was dying for his faith, a man named Stephen, Paul was there watching and approving of that man's stoning. And when Paul stood there and watched Stephen die for his faith, something snapped inside Paul. And from that moment forward, he became obsessed with wiping out Christianity. So for the next several years, he embarks on these vendettas, these ruthless campaigns to hunt down anyone who claimed Jesus as their Messiah, arrest them, and as a result, many of them were dead, stoned to death as a result of Paul's efforts. Can you imagine that? Think about that when you read some of his letters. Paul, as he talked about following Jesus and being a, an apostle for Christ and sacrificing for Christ, you know, in the back of his mind, he's always remembering, I'm sure, the fact that his life didn't start that way. He killed most of the Christians he met in his early days. And he knew he was forgiven for it, of course. But do you think maybe that had some motivation for why he worked so hard to bring the gospel to someone else later? Maybe so. And for the next 
series of years as he went through this campaign against Christians, his name became feared among all Christians. Everyone knew Saul was the guy you didn't want to have an encounter with. Then, on one particular journey, on a road to Damascus, we, we all know, Jesus appeared to Paul on that road, and instead of Paul arresting Christians on that day, Jesus arrested Paul. And in that moment, Jesus told Paul, you're about to serve a different cause. And instantly, as a result of what Jesus did in his heart, Paul flipped. He went from trying to wipe out Christianity to working tireless, tirelessly to advance the movement of Christianity around the world. His transition, in fact, was so abrupt. It was such an amazing about face that for many years after that, there were those in the church who would not believe it. They had trouble with Paul being Paul. They were doubtful. They they'd questioned his apostleship. That's why you see in his letters so often, Paul defending his apostleship to his readers. He had this, this anchor behind him. He had this, this ball and chain he was pulling everywhere he went, which is people's memory, that he was a guy killing us all in the beginning. But by the time Paul had finished writing his letters and doing his missionary journey, journeys, he had proved himself without question to be the single most important and effective ambassador for Christ that the world has ever known. He wrote most of the New Testament epistles. He founded most of those key first century churches that we all read about. He personally discipled many of the leaders of those early churches. He traveled tirelessly through four missionary journeys around most of the known Roman Empire preaching the gospel. He set the standard for service in the body of Christ. He, perhaps more than anyone else who's ever lived since Christ, can fairly say, imitate me as I imitate Christ. I don't know what you feel about this man when you read his letters. Sometimes I think he gets a bad rap. People tend to take something he says, wherever it is, get offended by it, think he's a harsh man, a cruel man, misogynistic, uh, self-righteous, whatever, which is completely wrong, completely wrong. He is our model short of Christ himself. You could do far worse than imitate one day of Paul's life as a missionary. So that's Paul. But now he didn't do all those things in his own power. And he certainly didn't do them alone. In fact, he was anything but a loner. He thrived on companionship in ministry and fellowship among the saints. And the letter, as we start now in verse 1, it reflected that. You notice at the outset of the letter, he mentions his traveling partner here at the time, a young man named Timothy. Timothy is one of about four guys that you routinely see Paul with as he traveled and he, and he went on his various journeys. You have Luke, Barnabas, uh, you have John, Mark, and Silas. And Paul valued their company. And he, he valued the support they offered to him in ministry. Paul was not a guy who wanted to do what he was doing by himself. And then after he founded a church, he thrived on the fellowship in that church. He would go back to churches periodically. And when he did, he was well received. People talked about Paul returning. In fact, what's interesting in the letter of Romans, one of the reasons he wrote that letter was to assuage their anger and their, uh, the, the, the fact that they felt insulted that he had not visited them. I mean, people really loved Paul's company. Paul showing up was a big deal. And Paul himself valued those friendships. So he, he says to this church, Paul and Timothy are writing to you. And then he refers to them as himself and Timothy as bond servants. Now, most of you have heard this term. Maybe some of you have heard someone preach on it, which would be great. Let me explain it for those who haven't. Bond servant, a bond slave, is a form of slavery common in the day, the predominant form of slavery in the Roman Empire of that time. Most slavery in Rome at this time was self-imposed. That is to say, someone made themselves a slave in order to pay off a debt that they owed to someone. Because if you had a debt you couldn't pay, you had two choices. Come up with the cash or work it off. And if you could not come up with the cash, you indentured yourself to the one you owed. And for a period of time, you were their slave. Now, don't get the wrong idea. It's not like you just clocked in from 9 to 5 and went home like a normal job. You were a slave. They could beat you. They could deny you privileges. You, your life was their life. You had no money. You had no possessions. You were owned by that person like any slave. But you're there because you put yourself there. And when they had worked off the debt, whatever agreement you had, then you could be free again. It was a period of slavery. But in the course of that service, if the slave, if the man realizes that, you know, the, the master I have is a good guy. He's a fair man. He's a kind man. He's taken good care of me and my family while I've been in this position of slavery. If so, that man might make a decision when he reaches the end of the period that he's obligated to serve. And the decision might be that instead of leave that service and go back out into the real world and earn a living again and toil and hardship to try to make something of your life, instead, I'll just stay here. 
You'll care for me the rest of my life. My family will be cared for. I'll work for you. I'll be a slave. I won't have liberty. I pledge myself to you for the rest of my life, but it's a nice life. It's a good life, and I like it. So I will make myself not a slave now, but a bond slave. That's the distinction. No longer are you a slave paying off a debt. Now you're a slave devoted to your master. It's no longer about compulsion. Now it's about devotion. That is the relationship Paul uses to describe how he saw himself with Christ. Now let me make a distinction for you. All Christians are slaves. Not all Christians are bond slaves. Here's what I mean by that. The Bible says that the moment you come to faith in Christ, you have been bought with a price. That is the blood of Christ. Your debt your sin debt has been paid. So you now owe Christ your life as a slave. The Bible clearly calls us slaves of Christ. That is a lifetime slavery because you can never pay off your debt. How do I know that? Because you're going to sin today. <laughs> In other words, your need for him never ends, so your service to him never ends. You're a slave for life. Hallelujah. This is not a kind of slavery you ever want to walk away from. But... In the way Paul describes service to Christ, he says his attitude was as a bond slave, not a slave. And the Greek words are the same, so I'm not making a distinction based on the text. I'm making a distinction based on culture. But Paul began his walk with Jesus, not as a bond slave, but as a slave in the sense of how we all start. Remember the story? Paul's on the road to Damascus, as we hear in the book of Acts. And then as Jesus appears to Paul, he's blinded, literally, physically blinded. And not just for the moment, he's blind for a period after so that he can't do anything anymore for himself. Christ has literally arrested Paul in that way. Jesus sends a man called Ananias to go visit Paul and help Paul to the next step of his discipleship journey. And when Jesus talks to Ananias and explains to him what he's supposed to do with this Paul, here's what Jesus tells Ananias, Acts 9, 15. Go to Paul, for he is a chosen instrument of mine to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and sons of Israel, for I will show him how much he must suffer for my namesake. How do you like that as a starting point? But that is how Paul began his service to Jesus. As a slave, do you notice that? Compulsory. I will show him. He will be a chosen instrument of mine. This was an offer that literally Paul could not refuse. And as a result, Paul being given no choice in the matter, he's enlisted into service to Jesus by faith. This is his salvation moment. And I think it's interesting, and I think it's worth noting, there was no invitation. There was no question posed to Paul. One, yes, Jesus said, why are you persecuting me? But that's not the question I'm talking about, right? There was no moment in which Jesus said to Paul, I got a couple of options for you. Would you like to work for me? Would you like to believe in me? Would you like to call me Lord? Would you like to serve me? That never happened. One minute, fire-breathing Paul ready to kill someone if they believe. Next moment, Paul calling Jesus Lord and following him blindly, literally. That's salvation. And theologically speaking, that's how we all come into the faith. We don't all see a light. We don't all go on a road to Damascus. We know that. But there is always a moment where God arrests us. Another way to say it is, we don't go looking for God. He finds us. And as Jesus found Paul and arrested him on that road and made Paul a disciple, he then sent Paul to a man, Ananias, who was to start explaining what was coming next for Paul. In this initial period of his walk with Jesus, you could say Paul was like a slave, compulsory, uh, no choice, uh, under the service of a master, a master he didn't really know yet. But in time, what Paul learned about Christ changed his heart. He began to know this master as good and kind and merciful and generous and loving and many other things of that sort. And as Paul realized his yoke was easy, his burden is light, his service to Christ was now about love, not out of compulsion. He moved from compulsion to devotion. You know, you don't do what Paul did because you feel guilty. You don't go do the things Paul did because you feel like you have to. You know the difference, right, with a kid? Your child who says, all right, I'll do it if I have to. What kind of quality work are you going to get from that kid versus the one that says, can I do it, mommy? Can I do it, mommy? Can I do it, mommy? Right? There's a fundamental shift there in thinking that leads to different behavior. And similarly, when Jesus became someone Paul wanted to serve, which obviously happened quickly enough for Paul, he moved in his heart from being someone that Jesus arrested to someone that wanted to serve Jesus out of love. And he became a bond servant. Now, if what I'm describing in this mindset is new to you, 
That is, if you're listening to this and you're thinking, I don't think that's how I think about serving Jesus. I, I volunteer if I have to. I show up at the church when it's convenient, you know, or my spouse makes me or whatever. You know, if, we all know that feeling sometimes. It's not unique to any of us. But if that's how you think about Jesus and service and, and, and Christianity in general, let me suggest to you, maybe that's a sign you haven't pursued your relationship with him yet in the way that you should. You, you don't get the relationship side of this yet. It's still all theory for you. Yeah, you believe it. I'm not saying you're not saved. I'm just saying you know it in the way Paul did on the road to Damascus, blindly. But have you really figured it out yet? That, that's what this letter is about. Why have I given you so much background on Paul? Well, it's in part because you got to know his mindset to understand his words. And Paul understood something about service to Christ that came out in his writing throughout, but in particular in this one letter. And he identifies, moving on to the next step, he identifies his, his audience here as the saints of Philippi. And there's something interesting about them that you need to know to understand the letter as well. I'm going to start just with a little bit of history. Not much, just a little. Here's a map, and it's of the what was really the heart of the Roman Empire at the time. And Philippi, as you see it up here in the corner, so little, I'll zoom in in a minute. Philippi was a very prosperous city. It sat in a province called Macedonia. And I'm just going to put the provinces of that day, kind of overlay them there. You can see now a little better. Some of those names might be familiar to you if you've read other letters. And I'll zoom in on Philippi for a second. The citizens of Philippi enjoyed a lot of privilege. They were a special town in Roman history, Roman society. They had immunity from taxes. You'd love to have that, right? They had self-government. Uh, they sat on a major Roman road. I'll show those here in yellow. Again, they might be hard to see, but uh, they were at a strategic location for trade. So a lot of trade passed through the city that gave them a lot of wealth, but it was also helpful for Paul because uh, Paul, when he traveled on his missionary journeys, even if Philippi wasn't necessarily one of his destinations, he had to go through the town to get to other towns. So Paul passed through Philippi multiple times in his missionary journeys. His first visit was in AD 50, so roughly 20 years or so after Jesus died. He's there for the first time, and he founds the church when he goes through there. The story of him founding that church is in Acts chapter 16. He was traveling with Luke and Timothy and Silas, and if you, you may remember the story of him going into jail with Silas, and as he's thrown into prison, that night there's an earthquake. They're, they're in prison singing hymns, right? And then there's an earthquake. The jail doors are opened. All their shackles fall off. God has set them free. And the jailer that night wakes up at that moment, and he sees everything open, and he realizes all the prisoners are going to escape. And so in that world, if you were a jailer and you let your prisoners escape, you died, uh, and not in a pleasant way. So he knew that, so he prepares to kill himself which he felt was preferable. Paul calls out on that night and stops him because Paul says, we're all still here, we didn't leave. Probably because Paul convinced the other prisoners not to go. That's the only explanation that makes any sense. And because Paul was willing to forego his freedom when he could have walked out that night and have an opportunity to preach the gospel to this jailer, he bore a lot of fruit in that decision. Because that guy, that jailer, saved from certain death by Paul's kindness, his heart's now open to Paul's message. And as a result, he eagerly receives the word Paul is preaching. He comes to faith that night. They go home. They visit his family. His whole family comes to faith as a result of that. From there, that starts the church. The church in Philippi got started because Paul did not leave the jail that night. And after that, Paul taught and ministered there for a time. He left. Then in A.D. 57, he comes back for a second time, leaves again. And then three years after that, A.D. 60, Paul's in jail again, only house arrest now in Rome. And he writes a letter from house arrest to this church because while he's in Rome, a man named Epaphroditus, who's from Philippi, is sent by the church up to Paul in Rome with money to give Paul as a gift to support him in his situation. And when Epaphroditus comes, Paul gets the gift. He's encouraged by that. He, he's thankful for that. But this guy, Epaphroditus, has got to go home now. So Paul sees an opportunity to send a letter back to the church with this man so that he can talk to them about what he wants to share with them. He wrote four letters that we know of from this vantage point from the house arrest in Rome. We call them all the prison epistles because of that. They're all together in the book of the New Testament, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, and Colossians. This is the third of the four. And I've taught the other three online already so you can listen to them if you're interested. But they all come from this same point of view, from Paul in prison. And if you want to understand this letter, you need to connect two things in Paul's experience. His time in Philippi began in prison, 
And his moment of writing this letter is from a moment of being in prison. And he sees the line that connects these two moments in ministry, and that forms the basis for his letter. What's the line I'm talking about? Well, Paul knew that his time of suffering in a jail in Philippi was the thing God used to bring a jailer to faith and to bring the church into existence. And because Paul was faithful to use that trial in the way God intended, a church got started. And because Paul started that church and converted that jailer, then now that Paul is back in prison again, it's that same community that can turn around and minister to him in his time of need in jail. It convinces Paul, it shows Paul, if he didn't already know, that God can use trial and suffering in your life to further the kingdom if you let it, if you use it. If you recognize the opportunity when it comes, instead of walking out of the jail, instead of finding the quick escape hatch out of your trial and suffering, if you learn to use it as God intended, it can pay off in a big way. And then in time, it becomes a source of joy and something of your need later. You know, the cycle, as you will, continues. Understanding that is the key to this letter, because in this letter, Paul is going to tell you things that don't make sense unless you understand that thinking. You know, it's not enough to simply say you should have joy in the midst of suffering. It sounds good. We all say it. We put it on a poster on our office or put it on a placard on our desk, and we don't have a clue how to do it, right? It's supposed to be that we will ourselves into positive thinking or some nonsense like that. That is complete nonsense. That is not biblical. That is not how you're going to find what God has for you. It's not about putting on a happy face. <laughs> Look, no, that's not real, and Christianity is, is nothing if it is not real. So, what Paul is saying is there is true joy, not the appearance of such, true joy, true peace to be found in the midst of suffering when you get what it's all about. That is, when you understand how God's trying to use it in your life. That's what we're here to learn in this letter. That does not come in a week or two. It comes because we follow Paul's thinking. All right? And we start in verse 2, Paul's supplication. He says, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, quick poll. How many of you, when you read one of Paul's letters and you get to this, this opening supplication or prayer, we just you know, breeze right through it. We pay no attention to it because after all, this is what we always say when we start a letter in biblical times, right? Hey, grace and peace to you. Grace and peace. You, kinda, you ever have people write you that way when they're trying to sound biblical? Grace and peace to you, Pastor Armstrong, to the saints in San Antonio. You know, you, I get it. It's nice. I'm not saying it's wrong, but you know what I'm getting at? We, we, we turn it into something like window dressing, it's just how you start a letter. It's like us walking into church. Hey, how are you? Fine. How are you? I'm fine. Yeah, we're all fine. That's fine. <laughs> Have a nice day. You too. <laughs> Meanwhile, inside, we're just, we're dying, right? That's not real either. I'm saying these words are not throwaway words. Coming from Paul, these words have power. And let me explain what I mean. These words were inspired, which means they are God's words to this church. And here's the part you may not have considered. When they read these words from Paul in their day, they knew that to be true. Anytime a church received a letter from Paul, it was a cause for celebration. They knew his letters were scripture in the moment they received them. Now, if you're wondering, how do we know that? Well, we have this interesting historical footnote to prove it. Peter, in his letters, at one point, confirms the perspective the church had on Paul. It's at the end of, of uh, Peter's second letter, and I'll just put the text up for you. Look what Peter says. He says, Therefore, beloved, since you look for these things, be diligent to be found in him in peace, spotless and blameless, and regard the patience of our Lord as salvation, just as also our beloved brother Paul, according to the wisdom given to him, wrote to you, as also in all his letters, speaking in them of, of these things, in which are some things hard to understand, which the untaught and unstable distort as they do the rest of the scriptures to their own destruction. Did you catch what Peter just said there? Peter wrote this letter at about the same time as Paul was writing the letter of Philippians in, in somewhere in the, the 50s or 60s. So here's a man who lived at the same time as Paul, writing at the same time as Paul was writing, and he says people often distort Paul's writings like they distort the rest of scripture. The rest of scripture. Peter's saying Paul's letters were scripture while Paul was still writing them. So don't get in your mind that someone came along hundreds of years later and said, you know, I think we ought to make this scripture. Nonsense. God's word is self-evident. 
He doesn't need us to say what his word is. He makes it clear to his people what his word is from the moment it arrives. And the church knew Paul was writing scripture. So let me tell you what that means. When God says grace to you, that is a measure of my grace, a measure of my favor, or peace to you, in the context of a letter, he's saying this letter's arrival in your life is bringing a new measure of my favor and a new opportunity for you to find peace. That's the promise of this letter, provided you read it and heed it. That's what Paul was saying. It's not a throwaway gesture of hello and how are you. It's Paul saying you have got your hands on the source, the, the solution to some more merit from God that is favor from God and some more peace from God. Things we talk about wanting all the time. I wish I could get that. I wish I could have that. It, it, the letter brings it. Now, if it happens for them, it's also true for us. It's just as true today for us. This letter and what it says will bring you something that I think many of us find eluding us throughout our life as a Christian. There's a lot of people I meet in the body of Christ who are not fundamentally happy people. Their lives are not where they want them to be. They are not pleasant. And, and, and there are a lot of reasons for that. But let me suggest something to you. If you've met Christians in your walk who seem to be somewhere you can't figure out how to get, they just seem to rise above the everyday problems of life. They, they have their issues, yeah, but they, it doesn't seem to bring them down in the same way. They seem to move on through it. They seem to make the best of it. Or they just seem to always have the right outlook. Things for them just seem to be at a different plane than you. They get something you don't get. They see something you don't see. If you've had that experience with some other Christian, I will bet you this. If you went to that person in a transparent moment and you said, look, I want you to tell me straight up, be honest with me, do not hold back, don't worry about my feelings. You tell me why I have not got your life. And I will bet you that their answer will include high on the list, you know, you probably aren't giving this enough time and attention. Whether you know it or not, Maybe the problem is you know it, but you're not obeying it. But somewhere in your walk, there's something different between what it says and what you're doing. And it maybe you don't know it, or it maybe you just want to do it, but the problem is still this. Now, there are other issues. I'm not saying that solves every one of them, but it sure gets most of them eventually. And Paul's saying, here's a letter that by its contents, heavenly inspired, you as a body can find joy, peace, grace, as he says, in ways you don't have yet. Now, I don't know what that means in your life. I'm not saying you're going to get rich or some other specific thing. That's not between, that's not me to say. I'm saying there's something in this letter for everyone who wants to receive it. And beginning in verse 3, Paul now starts the letter proper, providing the prescription for that outcome. Now, as we get through this, now here's where I said earlier, it's tough to teach an epistle. I'm just, I set you up with it now. I gave you the background and told you a little bit about who's writing and why. Now you get the big picture, but now we really need to get into what it says. That's where this gets tough because you won't be here every week. You won't listen every week. I wish you would, but I know that's not how it works. How do I keep you on track? Well, I think a roadmap for a book like this is more valuable than in most cases. So I'm going to give you that here today. There are four chapters in this book. And each of these chapters has a main thought, a main point. And each of these points, when you put them all together... They all support a common idea, a common theme. Let's start with the common theme. What is this book about? It goes this simply. Christ is everything. Now, that doesn't help many people right away. You hear that and you go, yeah, I know that sounds like something my pastor would say. Christ is everything. Here's what I mean, and I want you to hear me on this. This will make the difference between whether you attend these studies or not. Every reason you have to live Every reason you strive, every reason you excel in something, every reason you might suffer in something, every purpose in your life is Jesus and his gospel, period. Apart from the kingdom mission, your life has no purpose or meaning. I don't care what you're working on right now. I don't care what you're building toward. I don't care what you're endeavoring to create. Without Christ at the center of your life, nothing you achieve will last. Nothing you are building will matter. Nothing you're trying to achieve in your life with your family or your business or your schooling or anything else, no one will remember it. Do you understand that? No one will care that you were ever alive on this physical planet except how you contribute to the kingdom and the program thereof. Why? Because when this world has gone away, there's only two things that make it to the next world, we're told. This and your spirit. Thankfully, it includes the latter. But my point is, that is a mindset that we know is true. We all agree with it. No one's going to stand up and say, no, 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 Steve, I think, I think career matters. 
We all get it. But the problem is we don't live like that enough, right? We, we don't put it into action enough. We have to make our life a tool in God's hands to bring many sons and daughters to glory. And if we do that, our life has meaning. Suddenly it has joy and peace in ways that it never had before. And I will say this about a lot of people I meet, and I was one of them for many years. We think we're happy and we are miserable if we live in the world, right? We think gaining the next toy will make the difference. The bigger house, the next promotion, the next whatever. We all chase something. And we always think that's the thing and it never is, is it? Catch a clue. <laughs> it can't work that way. There's nothing in this world that will work that way for you. It's all vanity. So our intent is to make our life about Christ in all regard. And to do that, Paul says you need to understand four things. He breaks it down into four things. First, in chapter one, you have to learn what I just said in a nutshell. That is, he starts with the main point. You gotta make your life about Christ. Secondly, how are you gonna make your life about Christ? Well, to live for Christ, you have to have a goal to think like him. And chapter two is how you think like Christ. And in chapter three, your motivation to undertake all of this change is that you understand your reward is not found in this life. Your reward will come from Christ. And then chapter four, that leads you to a satisfaction that serving Christ is really the only thing that matters right now. In some form, in some way. Now, for the remainder of what we do today, just a few steps into chapter one, we're looking at that first goal, to live for Christ. And if you look across all four of these, and you do a little inventory of your own life, secretly, <laughs> privately, I bet you'll look at that and say, you know, I'm not sure that's where I am right now. I doubt any of us are fully there. But that's a challenge. How am I going to get my life organized? I, I like to think of it visually like this. Here's Christ and here I am. And, you know, some days we kind of pass each other and we line up. The goal is to kind of do this. I want to be lined up in all, all respects. What he thinks, that's what I think. What he wants is what I want. What, he, what he's called me to do in service, all of that is aligned. You don't lose freedom when you do that. You don't find less joy when you do that. It's the bondservant mentality. You find comfort, peace, security, joy, purpose, all of it lines up now because you're doing something you want, which is also what your master wants, instead of fighting against it. So Paul says this in verse three. I thank my God in all my remembrance of you, always offering prayer with joy in every prayer for you all, in view of your participation in the gospel from the first day until now. Paul says, I... I love this. He says, I, I'm always thanking the Lord for you as a church. I'm always praying joyfully for you every time I think about you guys. Some scholars have seen this and other things in the letter and said, you know, it sounds like Philippi might have been Paul's favorite. And it's, it may be true. I mean, this letter is, is written in such a way that he, he never says anything negative about the church, which is not usual for Paul. So he, he really has nothing but praise for this church. And so the impression is that they are his favorite. But look, if that were true, it's not favoritism. It would be because of something very specific. His favor in them is grounded in something, which he says right here in verse five. He says, it's in view of their participating in the gospel from the first day until now. That's his praise. And it is high praise indeed. Let me explain to you what he just said. In, in basic terms, to participate in the gospel is what we learned last week in the Great Commission, right? That's not the hard part. We understand that. We're all to be a part of some process of helping people know about Jesus. Got that. This church must have been doing that. But friends, that doesn't explain Paul's joy in them because every church did that. Philippi was not the only church that Paul could turn to and say, you participate in the gospel. That's not the issue. The issue is the degree. This church made participation in the gospel a way of life. The Greek word here that's translated participation, it's a word in Greek, uh, koinia. Koinonia is only used in this sense one time, two times maybe. Most of the time it's used in the New Testament, it's translated as fellowship, not participation. It's not them working alongside him. Paul is saying the way his life was structured is the way their life was structured. They shared the same gospel life he did. He's talking about a, a group of people who thought about their mission the way Paul thought about his mission. Can you think of anybody in the New Testament that made the gospel a way of life more than Paul did? He left his family, left his lifestyle, left his job, and spent the whole life he had in front of him walking around preaching about Jesus. Is there more lifestyle change than that? I mean, 
what I'm saying is, Paul said this is the church that he would think of whenever his mind turned to who participates with me in my lifestyle of the gospel, the same that I do. This is a church that did that. Now, as you hear lifestyle, your tendency is to go somewhere that's not helpful. And by that, I mean this. You think, oh yeah, we know about people who make the gospel a lifestyle. Steve, you're a full-time pastor. Uh, uh, Wesley's full-time pastor. Mike, yeah, we see that. Or our missionaries. You know, our church will introduce them to you next week at the business meeting. And our missionaries are full-time, dependent on giving from you to help them go off and do their work, right? Full-time ministry. Yes, that's a gospel lifestyle. But here's the problem with that thinking. That is the tip of a very large iceberg, that is to say, those are two ways in which you can make the gospel a lifestyle, but there are an infinite number of ways. There are just as many ways to make the gospel a lifestyle as there are lifestyles in this room. Because it's supposed to be everybody's lifestyle. It just doesn't mean everybody's in full-time vocational ministry. Don't make one equal to the other. They're not. Remember, Paul said this church fellowship with them. They had made the gospel a lifestyle. But we know this church was not 100% pastors or missionaries, right? I mean, you had people who walked the normal life of going to the marketplace, going to the fields, going to school, raising kids, attending, you know, going to the military, whatever they did. But they did those things for Christ. That's the difference. And so here's the way you need to understand gospel lifestyle, fellowshipping, as he put it here, with the gospel. It is this. It's like in that day, a blacksmith who woke up and got ready for his day. He did not say to himself, oh, my job today is to be the best blacksmith I can be. If you've had people preach that from a pulpit, you need to be the best whatever you can be, nonsense. You're not supposed to be the best blacksmith you're to be. He would say, how do I serve the gospel best today as a blacksmith? That's what your goal should be. Blacksmithing, who cares? But what you do in the gospel, that, that's what matters. Or the woman who wakes up and says, well, here's just another day ahead of me, housekeeping, chores, kids, raising, whatever, if that's her job. No, Someone who has a fellowshipping mindset says, today I get to advance the kingdom by how I keep my house and raise my kids. It fundamentally shifts how you think about your day. And the Philippian church apparently understood that. Now, as we go into the deeper parts of this letter, here's the challenge you all have to, have, uh, have to meet in your own thinking. And it's a question. It's a simple question. Why are you not dead yet? Now, I mean that sincerely because here's the question. We know our eternal future, right? Our destiny is not to live here forever, correct? As Christians, once you come to faith, your future is changed in a fundamental way, and you know that change. You know what it means. You're going to get a new body one day. That body will never die, never have sickness, never have pain or suffering again, never have any of the things that we have to contend with now. You're going to live in a kingdom where Jesus rules. You're going to have the purity of that rule, making life there nice and perfect. You're going to move through all of eternity with Jesus in a life that you're longing for even now. That's all certain. It's set. It can't change for you. But it begs a question, doesn't it? Get on with it, Jesus. Why am I still waiting here? Why don't all Christians die the second after they come to faith? I mean, in other words, why bother with the little 20, 30, 40, 50 years in between now and then? I mean, if we're going there anyway, why not just get on with it? Isn't that a good question when you think about it? The only answer to that question why Jesus has left you here a minute longer than necessary, the only answer to that is that there is some work he intends to use you in that advances the gospel in the meantime. So the question you have to ask yourself is, are you doing that work or are you wasting all that time? Right? I mean, that's the... You're, it, it, if it's, he didn't leave you here so you can become a Fortune 100, 100 CEO, or he didn't leave you here just so that you can you know, have all the toys in the neighborhood. He, you might get that in the meantime, but that's not why you're here. That is not your reason to live. It's not just to say you can get to 80 or 90. You know, People who just want to live a long time because they don't want to die, they don't understand their own faith. <laughs> to, to live as Christ, to die is gain. I mean, there's no loss in a death coming early for a Christian. But as long as you are alive... There's a question waiting. Why am I still here? And this letter, Paul's letter, is the answer to that question. Everything about your life from now until you die is about serving the needs of the gospel. And Paul thanked this church because he thought, finally, there's a church that gets it. We want to be a church that gets it. That's where we're going in this study. Now, as I said at the outset, some people don't like studies in letters. They're dry. They're boring. I just gave you a new reason not to like it. They're convicting. 
right? They're convicting. They show us things that we need to do. This letter and all our, our study through it is about adopting a lifestyle of the gospel. Not changing your job, not moving to the other side of the planet unless God tells you to do that. That's up to you. It's about how you do what you're doing now with a gospel mentality, with the idea that you have a purpose to serve in the kingdom. And as a result of this letter, I assure you, your life can be transformed. If you're one of those people I talked about earlier where joy and meaning and purpose and satisfaction in life is evasive, it's hard to get, hard to keep, may I suggest to you, it's because you're living for the wrong goal. Change your goal, change your life. This letter is about how you do that. Come back and study it with me. Let's do that together. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Father, I pray for what will happen in this church according to your will by our study of your word in this letter. Father, help us become the body that you intended individually and corporately. Help us, Father, to take what we learn and put it to work. And as we do, Father, I pray that you will be honored and glorified in it and that, Father, we will do all that you intended by it. Thank you, Father, for a place where we can preach and we can talk freely about these things. Thank you, Father, for a body that wants to hear them. And now, Father, the hard part, send us out of here, Father, with that beginning mentality. Ask us, Father, to think deeply about how we live our life and let us, Father, reflect on the answer that you give us. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.